Good evening and welcome to the policy subcommittee meeting for December 1st, 2020 of the Brockton School Committee. <clears throat> Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and state of emergency, on March 12th, 2020, Governor Baker issued an executive order temporarily suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, MGL Chapter 30A, Section 20, pursuant to the order um, public bodies are temporarily relieved from the open meeting laws requirements that meetings be held in public places, open and physically accessible to the public, so long as measures are taken to ensure public access to the body's deliberations through adequate alternative means. This meeting will be held and will be accessible to the public via Brockton Community Access, Brockton Public Schools website, www.bpsma.org, YouTube and Comcast Channel 12. The public can access this meeting via the following link, www.youtube.com forward slash the Brockton channels. All right, thank you all for joining us this evening. First order of business would be to uh, for us to establish a quorum and I will do so by calling the roll. Mayor Sullivan. Here. All right, D'Agostino is a here. Uh, Ms. Asak. Here. Um, Ms. Mrs. Mendez. Mrs. Mendez. My computer's like, can you hear me? <laughs> here. Oh. Thank you. Um, Mr. Minicello. Yes, here. Mr. Rodriguez. Here. Mrs. Sullivan. Yeah. Mr. Sullivan. Yeah. Thank you. All right, great. We have our quorum. <clears throat> so the agenda for tonight's policy subcommittee meeting, uh, review of current COVID-19 metrics, reopening for students with special needs, uh, revisit the overall reopening plan, winter sports guidance, and then finally any other business that needs to come before this policy subcommittee meeting. Um, Mayor, did you want to give us a, a, a quick update? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. And we will have Dr. Rick Herman, the city's medical consultant, on our full school committee meeting at 7 o'clock this evening. But I'll tell you, we're in the thick of things here in the city of Brockton. Last 24 hours, we've lost three additional residents. So our loss of life is 314 Brocktonians have perished because of COVID, 314. Our current total cases uh, have gone up uh, 86 new cases today. So we're at 959 active positive cases of residents. Total cases overall, 6,488. Uh, so those are the numbers. In terms of my information I wanna share with you, with the hospitals, we have 40 sick Brockton residents in local hospitals. 10 of those people are in ICU. A few of them are on ventilators. Uh, the average daily case count right now in the city of Brockton uh, with a population of 100,000 uh, within the dates of a 14-day window, which was November 13th to November 26th, is 37.4. That's a deep, deep, deep red classification. Positive test rate overall is 7.05%. So unfortunately, we're not trending in the right direction in any way. Dr. Herman and I had four different conversations today. You'll be hearing from him. Uh, at seven o'clock this evening. So unfortunately that's the metrics, that's the data and it's it's not positive anyway. Thank you, Mayor. Um, appreciate the, the update. Superintendent Thomas. Um, so um, thank you, Mayor. We look forward to Dr. Herman's report uh, at the full school committee meeting. So tonight we have uh, Sharon Walder, our chief student support services with us. Uh, Laurie Mason, our director of special education and Paige Tobin. Um, attorney for the district who advises us on, um, you know, anything to do with special ed and student services. Um, so they're here with us to just talk about the DESE guidance. Again, this is something we've talked about at length and, um, you know, we just want to talk about um, obviously in-person learning for, um, for students with special needs, but it does go beyond that because when we talk about our reopening plan, it, it goes beyond just students with special needs. It's students that are struggling in general. Um, and also our bilingual students. But, um, you know, Paige, Laurie, and Sharon are here to talk about uh, our students with special needs and um, 
the, the state guidance from the Department of Education. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm Paige Tobin, and as um, the superintendent said, I work with the district in special education and student services. And I have been in, um, involved in weekly conversations with the Department of Education, Elementary Secondary Education concerning COVID and the obligation to provide services and serve students with special needs during the period of COVID. Um, I think when we were last before the school committee, we talked about the fall reopening guidance, which clearly states that students with disabilities must um, receive all services outlined on their IEPs. And during any period where they're in remote learning, they should be receiving um, individualized remote learning plans. And the important thing to know about the guidance is that it does discuss um, and DESE has continued to highlight that even if schools are operating in a fully remote model, the district must make every effort to provide up to full-time in-person services to students who are considered um, high need students. And those are primarily the small subset of students that cannot access remote learning due to the complex nature of their disabilities. Um, of course, some update on that. The state is currently auditing districts who have not returned any students to in-person learning, students who are with disabilities who are high needs. And what they, so currently they have audited um, two districts who, one who had remained in yellow and one who has been red since September um, because looking for the following, which is what I think we really need to start to think about here, um, which is a clear path to return at least the high need students to in-person instruction and um, making sure that we're continuing to provide structured learning time to those students that we're looking very carefully at the students' attendance and participation. And again, particularly with respect to the high need students and how we are supporting those students. So while we need to remain um, flexible in terms of listening to health and safety um, advice and Dr. Herman and taking great you know, consideration into what he's saying, I, I, I do think it's very important for the district to start to um, have a clear path forward for returning at least the high needs students to in-person learning. I know that Lori Mason is gonna talk about that plan, but I would urge the school committee not to have a plan that sort of sets some artificial date that's way in the future without making sure that the plan is really, you know, I would almost, I would prefer, I think it's advisable to set a sooner date um, and to try to, you know, work with at least small cohorts of the very highest need students who are just simply not able to access education at this time and then grow that as you're able to do it um, because of the liability involved in not serving those students. The state has some guidance about compensatory educational services that students may be entitled to for the periods of time that they're not receiving in-person instruction. And I think Lori is going to sort of present the plan at this point. Hi. Um, so <clears throat> we have developed a hybrid model plan for our students with disabilities um, to re-enter back into school. With the exception of, I want to say, the Huntington Therapeutic Day School, they're a smaller school um, and have a larger school building structure, so we would have them come in the four days a week. But our life skills are substantially separate programs, life skills, our autistic programs, our city resource rooms, our motion impaired classes, we would recommend, I'm recommending they come in on a hybrid model, which would be um, two days a week. Um, we divide the class in half, which we've done all the legwork. We've already taken, um, each teacher has divided their kids into group one and group two. We've cross-referenced with siblings from preschool to high school to make sure that we have the siblings attending the same day. We have also um, contacted parents to determine whether or not they want their child to take a van or have a parent pick up and drop off. Um, so each class is already divided. We would have them start either Tuesday, Thursday, or Wednesday, Friday. Um, and I know that Jesse Guidance is really pushing for full time, but 
given the fact that many of our, all of our students have not been in school for mo several months. We need to transition students back slowly. We need to make sure that we're providing them with structure and routine, especially with giving them some, um, you know, some um, activities related around COVID-19 and about wearing a mask, being in the, in the school, back in the school again. Um, and just setting that structure and, and getting kids back in that routine. So that is where we are with the plan. And, we, and then as time goes on, we would integrate the kids um, three days a week and then four days a week. Um, Mondays would always be our remote day. Um, many parents um, have shared that they're very interested in having their kids come back a couple of days a week. And other parents have shared that they're not ready to make that commitment as of yet. But we have a plan in place. I've met with principals. Um, to determine pick up, I mean, things as like a van drop off, parent pick up, drop off, and are the kids going to go to the cafeteria for lunch? Things like that, that the building principals and I are working on um, to determine what's safe for students. Um, and that's what, you know, that's basically where we are right now. But we're ready to go. Um, I mean, obviously, Mike and I would have to meet with the transportation company to go through um, the list of students, but we do have everything in place. Okay. Thank you. Lori, it might be helpful to discuss how many students we're, we may be talking about to be bringing in first. Do we have an idea? Um, well, I did on my on the last PowerPoint that I presented, I don't have the exact numbers, but what it, basically um, there could be in some of the elementary schools, maybe 30 students would start two days a week. And then the high school, because we have a larger population of our life skills students up there, um, we're looking at more like 125, 130 would be two days a week spread out into 15 different classrooms. So I think that's really important. Um, and I can provide, I think last time I did, I did a graph of the number of teachers, the number of students um, that would be, you know, in each building at a time. And that information has been provided to principals already, um, of, you know, and, and where those, and they know where those classrooms are and those classrooms are spread out throughout the building. I think that's important information for you to know because again, we're talking about the highest need students. So um, the group is, is fairly small considering yes. the size of the district. So we would be able to, I think with Lori's plan um, with working with the principals really be able to have you know, a lot of social distancing um, mm -hmm. in place. And we've worked with the teachers on, you know, I've been over to most of the schools. I went and measured the classrooms to see you know, capacity wise met with the principals and pretty much most of our classrooms can hold 12 students. But as I said previously, to bring in, if a classroom has 12 students, to bring in all 12 students at once um, is not good for all the students because they're, they're not used to being back in school. So to have six at a time in front of a teacher and staff working through wearing a mask, a structure, routine, because it's going to be very different for them because mm -hmm. right now, sitting behind a computer with no mask on, no restrictions. And it's really, even walking from the van, being on the van with a, with a mask on, walking through the building with a mask on. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, spending time with the students to provide the structure. Um, and we do have a plan for that before they come back in. Um, we have scripts for the videos, but we don't want to present those to the students and the families yet because you know, we don't have a, a date and kids, some kids will get very anxious about thinking about coming back to school or, and very excited about coming back to school and ask their parent every day, when, when do I go? When do I go? I saw it on the video. So we're trying to be very mindful of when that would happen. And we do have lessons for the, for the teachers to work with the students with. And I think we can see now that some time has gone on that districts that have been bringing students back in person, um, it's been largely very successful with, um, you know, at least with this cohort. And again, um, I, I think the state as well as um, I know Lori and the superintendent are very concerned about the educational loss for, you know, again, these are students who really cannot access remote learning in with any um, real benefit. Okay. Um, members of the committee, any questions or comments? 
Um, Hi, I have a comment. Yes, Mr. Minicello. Um, I appreciate you know everything that was said. Um, I, um, I I I was I shared with uh, the superintendent not too long ago a um, video that a mother of a special needs um, sixth grader sent me, um, and he was basically you know uh, so frustrated and, and crying at the computer, and the mother was you know trying to console him, and you know you could just tell that uh, he, his level of uh, frustration had just, you know, reached its peak. And, you know, his mom is basically, you know, telling me, you know, he's not, you know, benefiting and he's just, um, it's just tough for him. So um, I, I think there's a lot of kids that are in this situation that really, unfortunately, um, can't adapt very well that are in our special needs um, cohort. So, so, it, so I'm, I'm glad that we are, you know, putting together um, a movement to, to, you know, slowly get things um, up to snuff. So, um, you know, we obviously we want to do it responsibly, but that definitely is the need for this cohort, this segment of our student body. Um, um, and, you know, um, the mom said I could share the video with whomever. So, I mean, I don't know if Michael, if the superintendent did, but I can certainly share it with those um, special ed department if they, they want to see what, uh, firsthand what uh, you know this is doing to some of our kids so I appreciate you got everyone you know moving forward so this is good yeah I, I agree Mr. Minicello and I've certainly heard from uh, some frustrated parents um, on the on the same you know uh, issue and and um, you know uh, I think and and to what attorney Tobin said you know had stated it you know we need to have a sooner than later date if I, if I picked up on what she said there. And, um, you know, I certainly want everybody to get their opportunity to, to comment, but, um, you know, I was thinking, you know, just off the top of my head, maybe a, a good timeline, although the superintendent and, and Lori Mason let us know if this is, if you can be ready for this, but maybe after the holidays, when we return, this is the beginning of, of doing this. Um, I know, uh, Mike, you've said, in general, you need about three weeks to get things prepared. Uh, I assume that would be the same here. Yeah, it's 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 the transportation. The company, you know, I, we 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 still were working with the BEA, um, you know, negotiating a hybrid model, obviously from remote. So we'll work, continue to work with Kim uh, and her team, who've been very obviously very um, accommodating and understand. Uh, uh, Kim follows the. Um, the guidelines closely as well. I know she's talking to Laurie several times. So, you know, they, again, as long as like Mr. Minichello says, it's responsible and, um, but, you know, we'll continue to work in cooperation with the BEA. And um, I still, it, it's mostly getting ready for transportation because uh, a lot of the drivers have been sent, uh, e they either been furloughed or they've been sent to other districts um, because obviously they had a some districts had automobile buses they needed. So for a student having a shortage of drivers anyway, uh, have sent a lot of the Brockton drivers out to other districts. So they would need time to two to three weeks to call those drivers back and, you know, make sure their, their vans are ready to run. So yeah, I would say about probably about three weeks. Yes. Right. So I think that puts us at basically, Laurie, go ahead. Sorry. And I also think that um, one of the other things that I really want to, be able to do with the, with the kids and with the families is get the kids ready. So I, you know, even though there's like, I, I just can't see right after the holiday. I think we need a little bit more time than right after the Christmas break, because I just think right now we're plan to plan the transportation and then to have at least a week or two to prep the kids for coming back. Um, Cause we don't want to prep them too early. Um, so I, I mean, I definitely sometime in January would be great if, if everything if it was safe and everything's ready to go. I just like a little bit of time, like a week or two to prep the kids too. Of course, yeah, no, I think, you know, yeah. you wanna do this right. Yeah. Know? Um. It, certainly, I, and, and, and I wasn't suggesting that we rush at all. Okay. <laughs> like, like, no. group of students, we need to, I agree we need to get them back in, but we need to do it the right way and 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 get it right so that it's successful for them um 
and 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 also, you know, we're going to need to, and I'm, I'm sure we've uh, there's already been discussions around this. I know there have been. Uh, once we do do this, and there are kids back in schools, how will we handle the possibility, like if we start to have some positive tests, because I can almost guarantee it'll happen, you know, then do we, you know, what's the, what's the, what are the protocol for that? How many positive tests causes us to close a classroom, close a building, cl you know, so we have to have some discussions about that and have that protocol ready so that when it happens, and I think it's a when, not an if, uh, when it happens, we know, you know, we're ready with a, with a, a plan of how we're going to handle it. Um, Lori, what do you think would be a realistic um, time? Well, I think that we do have to look at, you know, this, as um, Paige had mentioned earlier, that safety and, and numbers. And I think that, um, I mean, it's a little concerning. I'm, I'm going to say it's a little concerning that the numbers keep going up, as um, Maya Sullivan had mentioned. And I watched that. Um, I watch that every week. I and mean, I was hoping to see a downward trend, but we're seeing an upward trend. I think that that, I mean, is so, all kids would benefit from being in school. So I think that whatever decision the school committee or timelines, you know, I'm gonna go along with wherever or, or assist with whatever I need to do. Um, we have our plan in place. I have to work with Mike and the transportation company to get those, as Mike said, people in furlough get those van companies, van um, up and ready, get the routes ready to go, and then really work with the parents to transition the kids back in. So I, I don't, did that answer it? Did that answer it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I think, and I, and I know several members of the committee have their hands up and I, I'll, I'll, I'll let <laughs> everybody weigh in. Um, but Mike, you and I had talked about doing another parent survey and, and actually yep. separating out, you yep. know, uh, certain groups of parents, and, and I believe you know the parents of our, our special needs students were were one of them. Just to yeah, that's that will be out by Friday. Okay, and we'll run into because we wanted to make sure we had the information and results back for the committee because I know we we're, we're going to revisit when we reopen on the December fifteenth meeting. So I wanted to obviously give parents time to do that survey. So it'll be out this Friday. You know, parents will have a week. So we could get the results, and when the results are ongoing, we continue to get those, and we can sh continue to share those because uh, it's live results the way it's set up. So we can continue to send those updates to you every day that we get them in. So uh, we're working on the questions. There'll be spe there'll be questions for the different age groups, the different levels, and also with um, with the um, you know special needs parents of special needs students as well. There'll be questions. Right. So that'll be out by Friday. Okay, great. And yeah, I mean, we'll have to plan this, discuss this and make sure that it makes sense to do it. I don't want us to do it because Desi is pushing us into it. Um, it, it we also have to, I mean, I know that that is what we're being pushed to. Every, all districts are being pushed, not just us, but, you know, we got to make sure that I guess what I'm getting at is, can we do it safely? And are there learning opportunities that we just can't provide in this remote setting that some of these kids absolutely, you know, oh, they all absolutely need it. And so, you know, that, that, that is created an urgency that kind of supersedes the rest of it. But um, anyway, all right. So um, in no particular order, uh, Mrs. Sullivan, I think you put your hand up first. So I'm going to start with you. The floor is yours but you're muted. I was gonna ask the same question you already asked about the timing. Okay. So, um, but I do agree. I wanna thank them, Paige Tobin and Laurie Mason for their presentation. Uh, I do agree with them that our high needs students need to be in school, or whatever we can do. I, I know the numbers are rising, um, but I believe, and we could ask the superintendent, I believe there is a plan in place for when they do go back, if there is cases and what is to be done. And I believe we have that handout. Yeah, I'll, I'll get that also. I'll put that back in Friday's packet because it went out with the, it was a while ago, went out with the reopening. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's clear state guidelines. It's clear guidelines from DESE. 
And there's also guidelines we have to follow, whether it's a student, a staff member, then obviously close contacts. And, you know, I've watched other schools across the state that are in hybrid and, you know, if a staff member gets it and then, they're clo- then they have close contacts and there ends up being, you know, 20 staff members that end up being close contacts and have to quarantine, and then they end up closing the school down. So, you know, we would follow those strict guidelines and obviously in consultation with Dr. Herman, the mayor and the board of health, because uh, that's what uh, obviously the guidelines call for is continued cooperation with the local um, health officials and the board of health. Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Minicello. Um, I would suggest that we speak with the, um, the health department, our board of health. Um, the board of health has the most power in a situation and circumstances like this, even more than the police. The board of health can act immediately if they think there's some sort of a um, uh, health danger or risk. And I think that we are in a situation in Brockton where we could require um, testing once a week because of our high numbers and exigent circumstances. And that's a legal term of art that would require um, testing once a week for our, the small population who we would be, you know, um, having come back to the school for the health, safety, and welfare of the students, as well as the staff in, in, under these conditions. So I think we need to talk to the Board of Health and our legal team and um, have at least once a week testing, bring these, these this segment of the population back and ensure the safety of our staff, uh, you know, and, and, and the parents are going to want, I would think that their own children, you know, are safe in light of, you know, the circumstances that exist. So I, I, th- I think that that can be and should be done and um, is possible in these uh, 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 serious and uh, critical times in the city of Brockton. And that can be done. I know it can be done legally. Yeah. And, and, and you make a good point, Mr. Minichello, the, the, the Department of Ed uh, for red districts, um, especially red districts that are fully remote, uh, they are offering a program of testing that we would obviously look into and explore. We also, and I'll also see if um, someone from the Department of Ed can join one of our subcommittee meetings within the next couple of weeks that can go over that. That'd be great. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's definitely possible. And, and, you know, Lori Mason mm-hmm. makes a very good point. You know, you know, she's concerned not only about the kids' safety, but the, you know, the staff too. And, and that's a very valid concern. And, and we all, uh, we all, share that concern. So that's why I'm saying, just like they're doing over, you know, at all the colleges, state colleges, as well as, you know, private colleges, they're testing those kids once or even twice a week. We can do it, especially in a community that is in such, um, you know, high red, in the high red zone. And and, and it's legal. I'm telling you right now, it's legal. I don't want to hear the bullshit that it's not. We got to do it to get these kids back to school. Um, May I? It, it, so um, it is DESI, it is not a requirement of DESI that we test, but it is possible to go beyond their requirements. And there are some districts that are doing that. Um, and then the districts that I'm aware of that are doing that are um, have one has an arrangement with Emerson Hospital. And so they have again made arrangements for families, you know, so it's not a, a cost to the family to do that testing, but that is happening in some communities um, and some are doing it. Some of the communities that were allowing students to participate in sports at one point during the fall also were requiring testing. So that is something that, again, is not required by DESE, but it is permitted um, for districts to individually decide to do. All right. Um, so, and yeah, that that's, something we've been tossing around since the beginning of this is, is testing legal. Um, and, you know, this is also, we're talking about a smaller group of students. So this would be probably if we're going to implement, if we, if we do move forward with this and we're going to implement some kind of testing um, requirement, you know, this seems like it would make sense because to start that with a smaller group of, of students going back in, you know, um, so, um, Mr. Minicello, it sounds like you've looked into this and that it is legal. We just want to obviously make sure 
with our legal team attorney Tobin maybe is that is that are you aware of that or could or would you be able to check into that okay all right <clears throat> um next was miss asac thank you actually um mr minicello and um attorney tobin pretty much touched base on what i was going to comment on um as always laurie mason has um gone above and beyond for our special needs and we do appreciate that and my main concern would be to just keep everybody safe. I do understand we have to get them back into the classroom, but we're at our highest numbers right now and, and, it, and they are gonna get higher. Um, I agree with projecting and preparing to see what we need to do, get ready and fingers crossed, hopefully after the holidays, uh, you know, we're not in a lockdown, given the rate that we're going at, it, it's getting pretty scary. Um, I mean, I've gone on a regular basis because I deal with the public and for my safety and my family's safety, every couple of weeks, I'll go right to Massasoit, I'll get tested. As long as I'm fine, I'm fine. Um, so having our students get tested, it's a simple nasal swab, you know, and I think that would give us a little more reassurance to keep our teachers safe, keep our students safe and keep the family safe that the students go home to. Um, so if the attorneys could look into that, uh, I would feel more comfortable. Um, I, I understand the frustration. I'm, I'm hearing from families like everyone else, but as an adult, I can't keep that mask on. I, I'm like a little kid at times. I'm like, I can't breathe. I gotta take this off. Um, how do we expect our students to do that all day long? And these are our special needs students that really need to see facial expressions at times. And when you have a mask covering a face, that's going to be a little more difficult. I mean, Laurie, am I right or wrong? It's just a lot of them see the facial expressions with the teachers. And when your teachers got their face covered and, um, you know, their, their faces are covered. It's just, it's all about the atmosphere. And it, it, as far as like the, the learning atmosphere that we're trying to bring them back into. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, chime <clears throat> in anytime. No, I think that it is difficult for students and staff to be able to teach with a mask, but that's kind of our new reality right now. So again, Joyce, me, I am the same way. I have to take my mask off. I can't, I can't stand it. Um, but I did purchase masks that have um, the clear mask for staff and students. So at least you'll be able to see, um, you know, lips moving and things like that. But I mean, kids are going to struggle when we first go back. Um, and I, you know, I, I talked to the staff about it and they're like, oh, because right now they're teaching without their, you know, they're in a room, they're, this teacher who doesn't have a mask on, they're teaching to their students who don't have masks on either. However, when the kids come back, that is the reality. Because when we walk around Central, we all have our mask on. The teachers walk around the buildings, they have their mask on. It's going to be a huge adjustment, a, a huge adjustment for students and for staff. Um, and some of my teachers have asked the same thing, Joyce. Well, what, the kids need to see my face. They need to. So that's why I got the different clear, the clear mask. No, that, that's wonderful. Those masks, I've seen them. Um, and it's great because they are clear um, and it will help. And honestly, 2020 has been a year of adjustments and, and, and a new way of learning. Um, so it, like everything in the beginning, I'm sure we're going to have our struggles. And then, you know, I'm seeing some kids really excelling at, at the, you know, um, fully remote. I, I mean, students that were never really doing that well, are, their grades have, have gotten, you know, amazing. So, and then there are students that are struggling. So mm -hmm. we, we definitely need to try to get back um, into some kind of a, some kind of a normal. We, we need to get them face to face. And I am seeing a lot of teachers. I was dropping things off at some of the schools and even the teachers, they were just so excited to be able to see the students face to face. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like we get to see them. They're coming by in the cars and it's just, they miss that. They miss the rapport that they get to build with their students because they do spend that one on one on one time with them in person. Um, it's a little, it's, it's, it's different than the um, remote learning. A teacher builds a different type of a relationship when they're able to um, physically see their students. Um, so, and a lot of them are missing that. A lot of them are missing that. So um, fingers crossed, hopefully, you know, 
after the holidays, we can try to figure something out just as long as it's safe. And as long as Dr. Herman and our board of health um, are behind us in, in, in trying this out, I would feel more comfortable as long as we can test them and everyone is safe. But as always, thank you for always, always going above and beyond. We do appreciate it. Um, all right. Uh, and just, again, I want everybody to have their chance, but at the same time, uh, the, the clock is not on our side. So we got to kind of keep our comments um, uh, short and to the point. Um, Mrs. Mendez, please. All right. So I just wanted to ask, so, um, Lori, you mentioned a little bit about some parents being excited while others still want to continue. Can you hear me as well? I'm trying. I, you're really soft. <laughs> Can you hear me better now? Yes, yes. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Some, par some parents, you mentioned how some parents are excited while others still want to be remote. How would this look like in class for teachers? Will teachers be teaching students synchronously like the ones in front of them they'll be teaching them at the same time trying to teach them remotely and the reason why I ask that is because I know that's something that the district that I work at tried to implement and from my experience and from I from observations and just hearing other teachers it was a complete failure so it's something that I would highly recommend to prevent here especially because it's our highest need student so social interaction communication skills is important so because we, we're talking about, sorry, Mark, and I'll get to the point. Because we're talking about, um, um, you know, that they, they have, that their struggle is, ha is being remote learning. I know in, um, in the district that I worked, what they did, they were still remote. Like they were in person, but still on a computer. So it kind of defeated the purpose of being in person. So just something that I wanted to put out there so we can start considering. Thank Great. you. All right. Um, anything else on this on this particular matter? We, we don't have to take a vote tonight, so we will have time for ongoing discussion. All right. I'm going to move on with the agenda, and we will move forward to revisit reopening plan. Uh, Superintendent Thomas. Yeah, this is, won't be long. I just again, when we talk about phasing students in, um, I need students, but we would also at that time. I think we have to do a phase in plan wherever we're allowed to do that. Um, I think younger students, and we're working on this, the district design team. Uh, and I know that not only that, there's other teams working. June has a team working, Ethan has a team working, and then the district design team made up of several administrators, teachers, uh, Kim Gibson, uh, working together to come up with, um, you know, really tweak um, what, look at best practices across the state and how um, those are working. Uh, look at the ones that are working well and the ones that are not working well. Um, and you know that's the one benefit of starting a hybrid plan later than everybody else is to come up with something that's very um, structured. It works. Um, again, it's very difficult. Um, I said remote learning. Uh, total remote learning for teachers is very hard. Um, hybrid is even harder. For, for teachers, it's 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 very difficult. So, um, you know, it's important that we put a lot of time in it. To, but it's again the phase in, and um, as we've heard from, I, the like Dr. Herman has even stated that the younger kids, pre-K to two, I mean, we'd look at phasing them back, you know, shortly after, um, you know, high need students and bringing them back in small cohorts, and you know, as you and then phase in as, as we go up in grades. Obviously, we'll have to talk something differently about Brockton High School with 4,000 kids. And, you know, can you just go, you know, you probably can't only go with two cohorts. You might have to go with three or four. And I know that uh, Mrs. Sullivan, um, you know, pointed out some things that are going on in Weymouth where they went with uh, more cohorts to keep the numbers down. So those are the things we're looking at and we'll continue to look at. We'll present uh, more information next week. And then obviously when we talk about it and take a vote on, on the 15th, um, you know, we'll have much more information, but it definitely has to be a phased in approach. Okay. Um, any questions or comment from the members of the committee on this item? <clears throat> Mark, can you hear me? Tim Sullivan? Yep. Go right ahead, Tim. The floor is yours. I'll be real quick. Just a one comment and uh, a quick question. The comment is, I agree that we 
we got to get these kids back in the classroom, and it should be done as soon as possible. And I just have one question for Laurie. How many students are you talking about on that first wave of special needs coming back? Total number of students? Um, I can, if you give me a couple of minutes and we'll go on to the next thing, I can, I can pull that, I can find that information. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Tim, we'll come back to that on other, on other business. Okay. All right. Anybody yep. else? All right. One? All right. Let's go to winter sports guidance. Um, and I see we have Kevin Cairo with us. Um, how are we doing, everybody? Good. How are you? Thank you for joining us this evening. Yeah, no, it's, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, just to recap that the fall went fantastic. And uh, knock on wood, we didn't have one positive case from any of our sports teams. We just finished up about uh, 10 days ago with cross country and everything went great. So now everybody is asking, what are we doing with winter? And my standard answer is, we don't know yet. We don't know. Uh, the MIAA came out with um, some guidelines and modifications for us last week. Um, I, I've sent those, hopefully you, you all get copies. I mean, there's a lot to digest. I mean, there's over probably 40 pages of modifications and uh, recommendations. And as a league, the Southeast Conference be, between Bridgewater, Raynham, and Dartmouth, and New Bedford, and Durfee, uh, we followed a lot of the protocols that were in place for the fall season to keep everybody safe. Um, I've outlined those for you um, in that, so hopefully you had a chance. There are a lot of changes in some winter sports that we traditionally have, like wrestling and indoor track. Those have been pushed to later in the year. Um, cheerleading, same thing, is going to be pushed to um, that floating fall season. So the sports that we're looking at right now are boys and girls basketball, ice hockey, gymnastics, and swimming and diving. And of those, only two um, would be in the Brockton High School facilities like that we don't rent. We rent the AZF rink and we end, uh, rent Spectrum Gymnastics. I've met with the folks over at those places, the management. Um, they've walked through all their protocols and guidelines and sanitation efforts. So they've been doing this for a while. They have been open during the whole uh, pandemic. They have protocols in place and entrances and exits. I mean, they, they have it down. Um, the, the thing that I, you know, we have to wait and see how everything plays out. What would we do if we get the okay to, to do sports? What would basketball look like and what would swim and dive look like? Because we're not allowed to open locker rooms. Um, that becomes an issue for swimming in particular, where traditionally kids would come in, we'd ask them to shower up before they got into the pool, then they would change and they would be on their way. And now that that's not an option anymore. So that that's going to be a big challenge. And, and for basketball, especially with the number of boys that we have that traditionally try out for the boys team. Um, there'll have to be some juggling as far as tryouts and practices and things like that. So is it- So Kevin, imagine? I'll jump in. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. So again, we want to do everything we can to make sure that, you know, our kids have, especially our seniors, have the opportunity to participate. And I want to commend Kevin and the coaches uh, for their work they did with the fall sports, uh, following all the guidelines, uh, making sure masks were worn, uh, following all the protocols that were, were laid out uh, by the Department of Ed, but also by our Board of Health. So we appreciate all the hard work. Um, again, we would make sure it's done safely. Um, you talk about basketball, uh, you have JV team. Uh, we would not be doing freshmen. Uh, we would have a JV team and a, a varsity team. Um, so you talk about boys and girls basketball, you know, we would obviously spread them out to um, different gymnasiums. Um, we would be using, you know, the four compass middle middle schools. Uh, so we spread practices way out. Um, you know, they obviously can't be practicing the way they used to where one team was on one side of the gym at the high school and another team was on the other side. Um, you know, so we would definitely use the other gymnasiums. We'd also have to go obviously later in the afternoon. Um, 
to make sure, because you have teachers teaching in other schools and to, again, to make sure to limit as much contact as possible, we would, you know, the times of practices probably would be later. Um, and, you know, following, I've been following what the, the, um, the hockey rinks have been doing um, and they really are strict with their, with their protocols. Um, as you know, we co-op with Stoughton um, which went very well last year and all of our, all of our uh, hockey players are, have been playing um, in private leagues with their teammates from Stoughton. And so that cohort has been together for a long time, um, pretty much throughout most of when they were allowed to go back. So over the, over the summer into the fall, they've been playing together. So obviously we'd have to follow strip, strict li- guidelines. I know that the rinks have been doing that. Um, and I know that the, the hockey team's been playing often with Stoughton, you know, and again, in a private league and, you know, there's been no cases. So again, we want to do everything we can to make sure that, um, you know, our students get that opportunity because we know what our seniors lost last year when everything shut down, especially, you know, all the spring sports that were lost. Um, so again, we can, um, we have to have a vote, um, by next week because, um, the 14th is the start update, um, but Kevin would need a permission to start the registration process. And Kevin, can you just tell us that they have to play within their league? There's no. Yeah, we, we sat down and we came up with, you know, what the schedules would look like. And it, it would mirror what we did in the fall in which we would um, just play within our league. So it would be eight, eight games and then we do an end of the year tournament for the basketball, swimming and diving, and gymnastics would would be separate because we're in a different league than that. The good thing about the gymnastics and the swim and dive is we would be allowed to do those virtually. So there actually wouldn't be another uh, school that came into the building or into Spectrum Gymnastics. You would just you know, do it virtually, post the results the following day, and that's how um, a win or a loss would be determined. The only ones that would be with contact would be with basketball and hockey. But we've decided that we would do a home and away against the same school during one week uh, on a Tuesday and on a Friday. So there would be no, um, what am I trying to say here? Where we wouldn't be traveling to other schools throughout the week. And it would just be against one school per week. And it just very similar to what we did in the fall with soccer and field hockey. And then we'd be wrapped up by um, February vacation. Great. Um, before we have comment for, or, and questions from the committee, Lori, did you have, okay, do you want to jump in? So there's about, there'll be um, on co- um, day, cohort A, which would be like a Tuesday, Thursday, there'd be 336 students with disabilities from preschool to high school. So in the Barrett Russell Center, throughout the elementary schools, the six middle schools and the high school. And then the Huntington Therapeutic Day School would be, there's about 55, 58 students currently enrolled there right now. Um, And they would be there four days a week. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. All right, Um, so did anybody want to um, weigh in or comment on the uh, the issue of winter sports? Just one other comment. That's why I think in conjunction with winter sports, that's why it's important for us to have the conversation about a return um, for our high need students, for, you know, our younger students, again, when it's done safely, because, you know, um, you, you do have to consider, obviously, we're gonna, you know, we're going to let kids come in for sports and they're coming inside. Um, that's why it's important for us to continue to revisit the returns to school again in a very phased, safe manner. And uh, again, um, we continue to work together with the BEA um, and our district design team to put a you know something that's you know in place. Obviously, that's very safe. But um, again, you know, I mean, we try to you know, the thing we need to do. We want to give kids every opportunity, and especially our seniors. Um, they lost a lot in their junior year and now they're seniors. And, um, you know, it's just something I want, you know, we, we all need to think about how important it is for them. 
Yeah, and, and these kids are going to be playing on, like Mike said earlier, they're already playing club sports. for their, So they, they're out there, they're playing, and if they're playing for the school, they're not going to be able to go out and play with a, another group of kids that is coming from all around the community. I know that they travel up to New Hampshire and play a lot. This would keep them all right here in Brockton. Um, you know, we'll limit the number of kids that are on a roster and we would cut down on the sizes. We'll space out the gym. Um, so just like we did in the fall, and we were very fortunate that we didn't have any positive cases. I honestly think that, you know, if we do things the right way and sanitize and have the kids wear their mask, that there's a pretty good chance that we could repeat what we did in the fall. Great. Um, okay. And remember everybody, before we open up for comment, the clock is still very much not on our side. So let's make sure we keep our uh, questions and comments uh, short and sweet. So with that, uh, Mrs. Sullivan has been patiently waiting. I just wanted to um, point out on the um, hockey and ask Mr. Cairo. So I thought it was interesting to note that Rockton High does not have a hockey team anymore. We are in with Stoughton for that. I didn't really yeah, know we, that. Yeah, so... Um, it was actually three years ago, uh, Mrs. Sullivan, we had to co-op co with um, Oliver Ames because we just did not have enough hockey players to um, have a full team. Right, Kevin, is Oliver we Ames? Had JV, we did a JV co-op with them. Yeah. Our numbers, I mean, our numbers were struggling that year. Yeah. I mean, and they were so really it, it didn't go well. Um, so uh, myself, Dr. Murray, um, and Kevin met with um, a group of parents um, who always have been very supportive uh, and obviously very supportive parents of, of hockey. Um, and they had been working with Stoughton um, and the, the kids have played youth um, um, hockey with those kids for a long time. So uh, we approached um, Stoughton, the superintendent and Cliff approached the principal and Kevin approached the AD and we were able to work out a co-op with them and it, it ended up being out great working out great because those you know all these kids have been playing together for several years when they were in youth hockey and they continue to play together now in club and it's actually it went very well last year um and it was able to keep the hockey program in Brockton alive um and that's happened with a lot of hockey programs across the state because of numbers especially in public schools um is that you know you co-op with another um, another local district and it ends up keeping the sport going. Yes, because we have been getting a lot of, I know school committee has been getting a lot of letters from kids on these teams yep. with Stoughton and Brockton. And they, they seem like, you know, really great kids and they really enjoy this hockey team. So is that on the list for the yeses that we, that that's did, a sport. Did, yeah. That's a sport that's allowed. Yep. Okay. So we can allow hockey, hockey, some, basketball, um, gymnastics swim. and swimming. Yep, exactly. So those four. Okay, because um, I really um, want to thank the students that did write letters in to us expressing concern about it continuing. Thank you. Yep. Right. Any other comment or uh, uh, question from members of the committee? One comment, Mark. All right, go right ahead. And then after you will be Mr. Sullivan. I mean, Mr. Rodriguez, you are Mr. Sullivan. Sorry. <laughs> My feeling is that the kids have suffered enough, the seniors from last year, the juniors from last year. Let's get back to, try to get back to normal and bring these kids back slowly. It's a good way to, I think it's a good way to do it. We'll be able to test it. As long as it's safe, bring them back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Rodriguez. Uh, this guy's uh, question is for Mr. Cairo. Um, what's the guidance on as far as like a fan base uh, for basketball? Are we going to just do it as we did soccer? Well, as of right now, we said as a league, um, just from a, a standpoint that we're going to have uh, to do the disinfecting after each game indoors, for right now, we would just say no fans because we'll be we'll have the ability to stream through Brockton Cable just like we did with soccer and field hockey. So for right now, I would say no fans. That that doesn't mean that that's written in stone. 
but that would be my initial, let's get the kids in, let's get them playing. Um, and then if we decide that we can bring some folks into the gym, then we'll take a look at doing that. But I just think it's gonna be difficult to social distance because the, it, you're familiar with the Brooklyn High Gym. That smaller court, I mean, we have to set up the chairs and it will take up a good majority of that. So we won't open up the bleachers on that side. The bleachers on the, the, the big set of bleachers, we have to have that for when the other team comes in that they need to socially distance. So it, there's just going to be a lot of crossover between parents and, and other teams. So that's why collectively as a group, we just said at this time, it's it, we're not going to allow spectators in our schools. Um, just to to clarify um, for you know parents that are watching, um, what's the reasoning why we're not um, allowing the freshmen to participate? Well, um, it's consistent with what we did in the fall, and it just cuts down on the number of people and just the space. Um, we don't have enough space. I mean, to accommodate three groups of kids coming in and, and having them go to other schools, it's going to be very, doesn't mean that a freshman cannot play. We're just not going to have a freshman, a, a separate freshman team for basketball this year. Now, is that like, is that, you know, set in stone far as a league, no freshman, or is that just Brockton alone? Well, I did. Right now, it's us. Um, Bridgewater Raynham is leaning to that same thing. All the other schools, everybody's kind of in limbo right now, depending on what they, first of all, for signups. I mean, some schools, some, some kids aren't signing up because their parents aren't allowing them to, to go and play. So it's going to be a lot on based on the numbers. Um, if they have enough to form a team, then they would try to get some games on their own. But for right now, I just think that being consistent for what worked in the fall, um, I'd like to mirror that in the wintertime. Uh, Kevin, do we know for we know for sure that the other teams are not having freshmen or not uh, the league? We we talked about it today, and and some are they're going to try, and but others like uh, Bridgewater Raynham, I don't think that they're going to do it because like same thing. They're like, why are we going to add another layer of kids that we didn't in the fall? I mean, that's I I just. I think we set the precedent back in the fall that we were going to do the JV and the varsity and it worked well. So I think we should just continue to do it. Just for the and then year. freshmen were allowed to try out for JV. Freshmen and were allowed to try out and we, we had quite a few freshmen that played JV. We did. All right, so you keep us updated on, because obviously something freshmen, if, if the other teams in our league decide to have freshmen, you know, they usually start a little bit later then um, the JV and varsity, and we'll just set something we might be able to still have and push down for a few weeks, you know, push a little bit late, you know, into the new year in January, mm -hmm. especially when the games are going to be. So basically overall, total number of games is around 10. Eight. We'll do eight during the regular season, then we'll do the playoffs just like we did in soccer, where the, the, we have a, a league championship where the, the number one seed, whoever has the most wins, they get a bye, and then there's a playoff system. and so you can potentially play ten games, yeah. All right. So we'll what we'll do is obviously if, if we once we if once we the school committee takes a vote, we can yeah. obviously allow freshmen to try out when we have JV and varsity tryouts, and then mm -hmm. we will keep in close contact with the other um, ads to see yep. you know if they launch freshmen a freshman team, then obviously would we would work to you know. Put, put a freshman team out there, which would be a little bit later, and they'd probably be playing less, probably be playing about eight games. Yep, they would just do it. Right. I mean, I think it's, I think it's just, I mean, if these other schools are going to have freshmen, I think it's just fair for us to, uh, to have it as well. Um, I mean, we're trying to bring, you know, these students back at any capacity, and uh, sports is, uh, you know, is real big, and I think, you know, we should, you know, look at that and and look at where we could actually place them in the city um, as far as having games or however we work out the schedule. Cause <clears throat> we don't want to just uh, not say boycott them, but, you know, shy them away and not give them the opportunity. I mean, um, freshman year is very important. I mean, it was very important to me, you know, as far as playing football, 
But I, don't, I would like to see, you know, something if, you know, if they, you know, New Bedford or Durfee, if they are going to have it, um, I think it's just fair. You know, this is Brock and City of Champions. And, you know, we take pride in our sports that, you know, we actually have a team in place to play these games. Okay. And again, we'll, we'll make sure, I, Tony, I'm, that we I'm spread good. out. Um, yeah. Use every gym that we have available, the you know, for distancing because obviously there wouldn't be able to be three teams practicing, you know, at the high school. I mean, we're used to having all six teams fit in to the high school and practice three girls' teams, three boys' teams, and that's the importance of having uh, the gyms across the city to spread out. And um, and again, if if the if the league our league launches uh, freshman sports, we'll definitely, you know looking to add, you know, would, would add a freshman teams as well. But, um, but in the, but before that, obviously we'll make it clear to all freshmen that they, they, they're welcome to try out for JV and varsity. We, we always open it up to all four grades for tryouts. Right. And, and just with the numbers, it's, uh, you can have 20, 25 people on one surface at a time, no more like Mike, like you said, we used to have three teams practicing or four teams practicing on, on the two, courts and it would be packed we can't do that anymore yeah all right um and i'll just close out the comment on this just i don't i don't know if the the email went to the entire committee or if it was just to me but the uh the coach who's from stoughton a, a teacher at stoughton um who coaches the joint team did reach out to me to uh and he may have included the rest of you on the email as well uh, but he, you know, I think it's worth mentioning. He reached out to uh, stress his confidence in the fact that this could be done um, safely, um, and uh, so I just thought that was, you know, something worth uh, worth mentioning. We don't need a, any action on this tonight as a committee. We have been provided from some information, <clears throat> and we certainly have time between now and next Tuesday night's meeting where we would need to take action. Um, to, you know, get our questions answered and get, do whatever uh, diligence we, we feel is necessary. So uh, thank you, Mr. Cairo, for, for joining us this evening. Um, all right. Is there any other business before we uh, call for a motion to adjourn? All right. Seeing no other business, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn policy. Motion to adjourn policy. Do we have a second? Second. Second. All right. I heard a motion to adjourn by Ms. Uh, ASAC, and I heard a second by Mr. Rodriguez. I will call the roll. Mayor Sullivan. Yes. All right. The Agostino is a yes. Ms. ASAC. Yes. Mrs. Mendez. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Minicello. Yes. Mr. Rodriguez. Yes. Mrs. Sullivan. Yes. Mr. Sullivan. Yes. All right. Thank you for your time this evening. We are adjourned. Um, and of course, we have uh, our regular school committee meeting. <clears throat>